Marcus, Director of Performance Improvement for the Washington State Medical Association Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce Pete McGuff, who will introduce the session and our speakers. No, all right. Thank you, Lance. And uh, first of all, welcome everyone. And we got a sunny morning, which is pretty amazing. So having you come uh, at 7:30 on a Friday indoors is really impressive. So welcome all. And I'd like to uh, uh, introduce you or welcome you to our inaugural, the first ever uh, clinical performance improvement network program. Uh, and we've got some great speakers, and I'll be introducing the first one in just a second. Uh, I would like to say that, um, like many of you, over the past many years. Uh, I, I've been interested in various aspects of health care reform, and I must confess that it was only about eight or nine years ago that, uh, having gone through a wonderful program on clinical quality, in fact, affiliated with our first speaker, that I kind of had a, a light sort of strike my forehead and really found that clinical quality improvement for me was uh, an amazing thing to become involved in. I think that when you look at all the things in our health care system, there are plenty of things that we really can't influence in an effective way, but uh, the care we provide our patients and how we do it uh, really is a huge opportunity. And I would say that every time I work with uh, our own medical group, I'm the chief medical officer of the UW Neighborhood Clinics, uh, I have found uh, that this is something that staff and providers really get excited about. Uh, and also it's something that our patients appreciate greatly. So I think that this is going to be a, a wonderful thing that our state medical association has been has decided to support. Uh, I think it's the right time. I think it's the right thing. So I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Ed Walker is the founding director of the University of Washington Healthcare Leadership Development Alliance, an interdisciplinary research and training center designed for evidence-based research development. Um, he is, uh, holds two academic appointments, first as a professor of health services uh, and also a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the UW. He's, a nationally he's nationally recognized for his expertise in coaching and developing physicians, and some of you um, may get an opportunity to work with him in that capacity, also for leading change uh, uh, in medical institution, and I think uh, very importantly, improving quality measures. Uh, prior to his current position, uh, Dr. Walker was CMO for the University of Washington Medical Center, so he has been able to walk all of these different shoes. So without further ado, here's Dr. Walker. Thank you, Pete. Is this the right place? Can you hear okay? Okay, good. Well, well, good morning. You all look a little uncomfortable. You know, the people that set up uh, these rooms used to work for airlines to, you know, get the seating. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is, people on the end, would you move your seats out about three feet, and then everybody else just absorb a little bit of that space so that you have a little bit more comfort. I'm going to be walking around and talking with you, and. Uh, one of the things I've learned as a teacher at the university is students do not like death by PowerPoint. So what we're going to be doing today, I have a couple of kickoff slides just to get us thinking about this topic. And then the entire rest of the presentation is going to be a conversation with you. So if you want to make a comment, please raise your hand and I'll bring my mic because we're, we're actually recording this and I want to make sure the people that are seeing this after the fact can, can hear what you're saying. So we'll, uh, we'll have that conversation. So I'm going to be talking about the case for physician leadership. And I want to make a pitch to you today as effectively the first person in the CPIN lecture series. We have to get control of quality. And we're going to get control of quality through leadership. Leadership and quality are hand in hand because if you don't know quality, I don't think you have any business leading. And if you don't know how to lead, you can't do anything in quality. In fact, quality is the main subject of leadership. So what we're going to be doing today is just trying to figure out what are the barriers that keep us as physicians from moving ahead in positions of leadership in our organizations, and what can we do about it? So this is my cartoon I've shown to every generation of physician leaders, the, the, the herding the cats. What have been your experiences about working with other physicians? in leadership? Have they been positive, neutral, negative? What do you think? Positive. positive. So you, what, what's been positive about your experience? I have a lot of physicians that I've worked with and I want to do the right 
thing. They have a sense of values. And it's only a few miscreants that cause me uh, <laughs> heartburn. So this, this is a seasoned physician executive, I can tell. It actually, I actually agree with you. I think the majority of physicians, when you align the goals of what you're trying to accomplish in the organization with their personal pa patient care leadership goals, it actually works out. And there are some people that resist because we know we have colleagues that are self-interested and they're going someplace else with medicine. But until that alignment takes place, this, the herding of the cats is really a very difficult process. Wonderful article in JAMA uh, from uh, 2007 by Michael Porter. Now Michael Porter, if that name doesn't ring a bell, if you get an MBA at Harvard, you will listen to Michael Porter talk to you about strategy. He is the dean of strategy. And Porter and Teesburg wrote this wonderful mandatory reading book called Redefining Healthcare. It came out about three years ago, and it's a kind of a manifesto about where the healthcare system might go if it behaved more like the rest of the world in terms of competition. We've kind of carved it out in a way so healthcare doesn't have to follow the usual rules of competition. Well, that's beginning to change now with the new legislation. In this article, they make the case for physician leadership. And I strongly urge you to go back and get a copy of this. Two important quotes. Number one, physician leadership is essential. Improving the value of health care is something that only medical teams can do. I mean, isn't that common sense? How many administrators follow you into the consulting room? How many administrators are actually at your side, at the bedside when you're making clinical decisions? It just really doesn't happen. That is our job. Now, I want to be careful that I'm not fomenting uh, a revolt here in which what we have is the issue of physicians telling administrators, we don't need you anymore, because that's not what I'm saying. What my main premise here is that we need to form high-performing partnerships with our administrative colleagues. They are the ones that really understand finance. They're actually a little bit better than we are at running teams. They're more experienced at doing strategy. But when you have a chief medical officer and a chief executive officer paired looking at the environment, <coughs> or when you have a chief medical officer and a chief operating officer looking within the organization at what needs to be done, and then if you have a chief medical officer and a chief financial officer making reasoned decisions about how the organization should spend its money, how quality and finance get balanced, remarkable things can happen. They also go on to say, if physicians fail to lead these changes, they will inevitably face ever-increasing administrative control of medicine. That's a given. We've been there once. So in the 1980s, how did that manifest itself? HMOs. So people that knew squat about the care of patients started making patient care decisions. Been there, done that. We don't want to do that again. But it's rising again in another form. And so th there's, th there's an important decision we have to make as physicians right now. Are we going to be part of the solution this time? So what do we know from the literature about what's true about MD leadership? Very interesting stuff. One of my MHA students just did, a Master's in Health Administration, just did a review of this literature. And this is what she found. First of all, the traditional criteria for physician leadership advancement has focused on clinical accomplishments rather than uh, leadership competencies. So when we promote so a physician to lead, it's because he's a good surgeon. That has nothing to do with leadership. It, it may not have something to do, but in and of itself, that's not the criteria for leadership. Or we like this guy's research. It has nothing to do. Most physicians receive no formal leadership training. Now, I would bet that that's not true for this group. It's, 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 how many of you have had some formal leadership training? Raise your hand. So this is a select difference. You're here because you're interested in this. But if you go back to your hospitals, go into the cafeteria and raise hands, it ain't going to happen. And the, the, le the leadership training that people have received is often inadequate for the amount of work that they're currently doing. Many physicians learn leadership skills through an observation of established leaders in a hit or miss fashion. So just like lumbar punctures are learned, see one, do one, teach one, we learn leadership, see one, do one, teach one. Now that's great if you have a really good leader that you're following. It's not so great if the person you're trying to learn from really hasn't been formally trained. Physicians are often taught to act as competitive, independent thinkers, hindering their ability to communicate effectively with other clinicians and to work successfully in teams. Boy, I've seen that happen. 
We, we are the cat sometimes. E even the leaders who are formally trained, sometimes when they go into the clinic, they revert to cat status, and they don't know how to go back on teams. Physicians have historically lacked the desire to lead, due in part to the cultural divide between physicians and administrators. I mean, how often have you participated in a, or heard an us-them conversation in a hospital? Those administrators, those people don't understand. And they sit in their little cubicles talking about those physicians. Those days have to be over because we are screwed if they're not. Physicians tend to experience difficulties in followership and working in teams. One of the definitions, the best definitions of a leader I've ever heard is a leader is someone who has followers. No matter what you think you are as a leader, if no one's following you, you're not leading anybody. And physicians, in fact, really don't like to follow. That's why we get into the cat herding thing. Physicians are in a unique position to influence the behavior of other clinicians and to influence physician satisfaction, an essential element for recruiting and retaining the best physicians. I don't know how many meetings I was in at the university where one of the administrators would come in and I would be sitting there. The CMO, the chief medical officer, is kind of like the interface between the medical staff and the executive. If you do it right as a leader, the executives think you're one of them and the doctors think you're one of them. So it's the Venn diagram where you're right in the middle of the two intersecting circles. If you get it wrong, the physicians don't own you and the executives don't own you. And then you play monkey in the middle. And the Venn diagram doesn't even include you in the two circles. So the problem that you have to do is not give up that sweet spot in the intersection. The problem is that often what happens, administrators will come into physician groups and they will say something and then all the physicians will look at their person, do you agree? And the power that you have as a physician leader is to just kind of go like this. And all of a sudden, the room lines up because they trust you, because you've earned their trust. And that's the power of the interface position that you can put yourself in. Medical centers are beginning to prioritize the investment in leadership academies. Now, a leadership academy is an informally defined idea that you just have some kind of systematic training. We did a thing at my in this institution called the leadership boot camp. We taught quality, finance, strategy, and um, what else did we do? I think those are the main three. And, qua sorry, and quality, quality leadership, strategy, and finance, those four things. And the, the, the value of this was we had a 101 course for all of our physicians. Then we had a kind of a 201 course that we asked people to take. It was call it's called the Certificate Program in Medical Management that I run at the university. And that's a full year of courses, 30 hours for each of those topics. But for the line physicians, we gave them three hours of each of those topics just to make sure they understood what is the idea about quality improvement, performance improvement? What is this thing about eliminating unnecessary variance? What's that all about? So the main idea in this quality improvement camp that we ran was basically just to get the basics down. Now, we learn as we go along that physicians are different from administrators. Physicians generally, when they're trained, uh, work alone, behind a closed door. For them, healthcare is a profession. We took an oath, a Hippocratic oath. We focus on the patient as the unit of our work. We have science training. We optimize a series of single outcomes, this patient's outcome, then this patient's outcome, then the next patient's outcome. We lead by our personality because we've really never been trained any, any other way. We're driven by autonomy in the good sense that we have to be autonomous and that no one is sitting in the room coordinating what we're doing and we have to be faithful to the achievement of that one physician <laughs> phys uh, patient outcome. We have to do en edge of the envelope focus. The, the, the thoracic surgeon who is in the OR with someone's heart falling apart in her hands has to make a decision about what they're going to do about this FDA investigational device, which is not supposed to use outside the study, but the patient's going to die without it. What do I do? So that's the edge of the envelope focus that many physicians find themselves in. So physicians logically see quality as a property of the doctor-patient relationship, that my sense of whether I have a good practice is, is, are my patients getting better? Are they liking me? Are they satisfied? Are they having the access they need? Are they achieving the outcomes that they need? Now, administrators are trained to do something complementary. Most administrators work in teams. So in my alter life, in the Master's in Health Administration program, I'm training 
not the residents that I train in psychiatry and the medical students I train in the School of Medicine, but the future executives of, of our region. And these are people, I, I just did orientation yesterday, we spent the whole day going in and out of small groups. How do we give feedback? How do we work in teams? Forming, storming, norming, performing. Understanding all of the dynamics of teams because most administrators spend their entire day working in teams. For them, healthcare is a business. Now, I don't mean that, that in the sense that it isn't a profession. That it is a kind of a profession to them, but they have the responsibility for the no margin, no mission. They have to make the hospital work. So look at what's happening here. We're starting to set up some very interesting dichotomies. We work alone. They're focused their day in teams. For us, it's a profession. For them, it's a business. We focus on the patient. But they look at the big organization as a whole. They have to look at the population, not the individual patient. The outcomes of the population are as important to them as the outcomes of the individual patient are for us. Sorry? They have systems trained. They are trained in the big picture. Now, some of us as, as family physicians are trained in systems thinking, but medicine in general is not a systems-oriented enterprise. While we optimize single outcomes, they're trying to optimize the big picture. So when the Joint Commission comes, that's a good example of how the big picture is being looked at because they have to focus on standards and compliance. They're trained to lead. Most people in administrative positions have actually been through formal leadership training. While we're driven by autonomy, they're driven by standards, and that's their responsibility. We look at the ed edge of the envelope, but they have to look at the center of the envelope, the core of compliance. So for them, pro quality is a property of the organization. Now, this tension, as it's been set up historically, has put physicians over here really skeptical of what administrators are doing, and it puts administrators over on this side skeptical of physicians. So if you went back 20 years and got picked a random physician and a random administrator out of the population, they'd be a little suspicious of each other because they didn't really understand each other's world and, th and their worlds didn't really clash, uh, didn't really uh, uh, cross very much until they clashed. So remember the old doctor's lounges that were ubiquitous 20 years ago that are beginning to kind of disappear now as we have a more equitable understanding of teamwork. Well, those lounges were mirrored by administrative conference rooms and we had our places where our clan would get together, make the plans, but there were no common spaces. And one of the things that's happening now is the creation of more common spaces. Some of them are psychological, some of them are workspaces, but in any case, it's, it's more likely now that an, a, an administrator and a physician will be getting together. So the other thing in the literature is, does all of this stuff make a difference that we're talking about? If we, if we step up, and if we go back to this diagram, whoops, what did I do here? If we go back to this diagram and we say, where should the physicians of the future live? My advice to you is right on this interface. I don't think we need to become administrators, but we have to stop thinking that we're over here at this edge of the continuum. The sweet spot is for us to come this way and the administrators to come this way so we form these high-performing partnerships someplace closer to the middle. If we do that, does it make a difference? So the first thing, Physician leaders positively influence patient outcomes. This is in the literature now. Quality goes up, error reduction goes up. So hospitals now consider physician leadership training and development to be worth the investment. The business case for quality and the business case for physician development is now a closed issue. We know it works. Patients get better care when physicians take leadership training. Hospitals are run more efficient. As errors go down, costs go down. As quality goes up, costs go down. Not uniformly, because you, I, for, for an organization that's not investing in quality at all, costs will first go up, because you need to put in the investment in quality. But as you become lean, efficient, and focused on quality, costs begin to go down. Physicians who practice effective teamwork in communication in particular will achieve better results. You know that old saw, what's, what's the figure that a physician interrupts a patient in the first how many seconds? 
yeah, it's, it, it yeah, it's 18 seconds or something like that. Well, that's part, that transformation to the listen, listen, listen thing that's so important is part of the transformation that we're looking at. Physician collaboration actually improves uh, patient satisfaction, reduces length of stay, and leads to better integration of clinical care across service lines. So i.e., when physicians and administrators collaborate, talk together, and when the physician has a good sense of leadership, that's when these things are maximized. And finally, an organization's commitment to physician development is positively associated with quality. The more the organization spends on leadership development, the more the quality measures of that organization seem to go up. So that's the case. So my pitch to you is strong, complementary partnerships make for the highest quality of care. So what are the common skills? Well, I'm going to show you very quickly four slides, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on. The first is this Ballantine. I did it again. It doesn't want to go backwards. So Suzanne, when you get up here, don't push backwards. It doesn't work. So um, this is the National Center for Healthcare Leadership, which is the organization that sets the standards, kind of like the ACGME for us. This is for people who are studying hospital administration. There are three main areas that they try to teach. One is transformation, the other is execution, and, and finally a focus on people. Let me amplify, I know it's hard to read these, so let me amplify in the next se uh, section here. These are the skills of transformation. And these are the skills that physicians need to take to complement the, the, the same uh, skills that are, that are being taught to the healthcare administrators. These are skills in general that take the organization from one place to a new place. These are the execution skills. This is the ability to get stuff done. So whether you're trying to execute a financial plan in which you'd, you'd use all sorts of financial execution skills, or you're trying to drive to a quality target, this is the type of stuff that is the leadership aspect of quality. And finally, people skills. And physicians have a head start on this because, in fact, I think in general, physicians are actually better than many administrators at people skills because we get involved with people right away. So this is an area we actually have something to teach our colleagues and to share because we've spent so much time caring for patients. So I want to move to the discussion now in the remaining time. So what's been your experience in trying to manage and lead? I want to I ask you about the barriers that you've experienced in forming these high-performing partnerships with, uh, with your uh, physician administrator uh, colleagues. And what would you like WSMA to do to help you? So this Clinical Performance Improvement Network is, is an investment that WISMA is making in your future. And it is asking you, with respect to quality and with respect to leadership, what could be done that would help you? One of the issues that I've uh, come across consistently has been inconsistency. Uh, are, uh, when you talk about continuous quality improvement, the non-continuity -con within an organization, uh, uh, whether it's a change in leadership, change in personnel, uh, change in policy, either from day to day, month to month, year to year, uh, most of the quality improvement stuff uh, says that you have to have a stable business environment in order to have a longitudinal improvement. And of course, we're not in a stable business environment. And uh, the lack of continuity, I think, has been the biggest problem that I've seen throughout my time. Right. And in order to get continuity, you have to worry about something called succession planning. So the, the, the CEO needs to know when he or she retires, who's going to be the next CEO? And what I say on the medical staff side to complement that is, if you know who your chief of staff is right now, you should also know the chief of staff who's going to be there six years from now because that person should be, be being groomed. It should be someone who is not now an acknowledged medical staff leader, but that person ought to be encouraged by the existing physician leadership to move ahead into that position. Maybe it's going to be you're going to go to the American College of Physician Executives and take a course on quality, and that's going to light the fire. The hospital has to be smart enough to say, you know, I really like Pam. I think she'd make a good chief of staff. Let's send her to the ACPE meeting and let's see if we can light her pilot light in terms of physician leadership and quality. And the vision 
of managing to the future, the future quality state of the organization, removes a lot of that, that, that ambiguity. Anybody else? I, I agree with what Hugh said about what doctors think, which is that most of us want to do what we think is the right thing. The problems that I've seen are when you're trying to convince people to do something and they don't see that as being the right thing or they don't see that as being beneficial to them. Or when someone comes to me, we want you to do a QI project, but this is going to take this many hours out of your week, which time which I don't have, and I don't see that that project is going to lead to anything that's really worth doing, then you, you, you can't get people to do so. So I think the trick, I think as you're suggesting, is to get docs sort of on board with this is where we're trying to go with this and this is worth doing. So I think this has to do with a process called influence. We, we really are not going to force quality in our organizations. What we're going to do is we're going to align interests. So I can come, what's your name? Cindy. Cindy. So I'm going to come up to you, Cindy, in the cafeteria. And are you a family doc? Wh what's, your, what's your specialty? Emergency, Emergency medicine. So I'm going to come up to you and say, you know, Cindy, um, we got a complaint the other day uh, that got my attention about, s about wait times in the ED. And uh, um, I would love to sit down and chat with you about this. You must have some really good ideas about that. So we sit down, and the first thing I do is I engage Cindy, and I try to re reestablish my relationship with her. And I said, before we, before we talk about this, Cindy, let, let's just catch up. How, how are your kids doing? What's happening in your life? That kind of stuff. And then I say, I, I would really like to think about how could we work together to reduce wait times. Now, are you, are you interested in this? Oh, sure. <laughs> now, <laughs> so what, what we want to figure out now is it, here's the problem that gets to what you said. Cindy wants, you want to give good care, right? Okay, so let's take that off the table. The wait times are not the result of Cindy's lack of desire to give good care. The wait times are the result that Cindy lives in a world of competing values. So Cindy, tell me, what are some of the barriers, what are some of the real world things that make people wait in the ED? We can't get patients into inpatient beds. So okay. This is so typical. There is no simple problem in the hospital. Because remember your mother said, if that little uh, thing, uh, that little string is there, don't pull it. Because what happens when you pull it? The garment starts to unravel. So w one of the things that you illuminated is when you start to work on quality, the first thing you notice is it's like a string. You pull it, and you're really damn sorry you pulled it. Because what happens is it unleashes this pack of devils that come at you. So for instance, then I, then I go, what's your name? Hamilton. So I'm going to make you the inpatient uh, hospitalist in charge of beds. So we need to free up some more beds. Why doesn't that happen? You know, the, 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 it, it's the housekeeping, it's the nursing, it's the uh, <laughs> administrators don't appreciate that we need more beds. Here we go. So now what happens is exactly what you said. Now what happens, though, if I say, I get Cindy and Hamilton in a room. Uh, what, what's your name? Don. Don. So Don, I'm going to make Don a non-physician for a second. He's our uh, director of environmental services. And Patricia is going to be our CNO for a second. I get the four of them in the room. And I say, we've gone around in circles on this forever. Let's not try to boil the ocean. Let's see if we can change one thing, just one thing. So, and I say, I want each of you to think of one small thing that we can do related that will, that it's going to make every one of our worlds a little bit different, but we're not going to, we're not going to take no, we're, we're going to take a firm stand. So it might be that you make a commitment to try to see the patients a little bit more f uh, quickly, which means that Hamilton is going to try to free up some more beds. So he needs Don and, and Patricia's ideas on how to do room turnover and nursing shift change. Now, they're absorbing all sorts of crap from their constituencies. He's getting stuff from the other hospitalists. You're getting stuff from the housekeepers. You're getting stuff from the nurses. And what's happening, though, is we're inching toward a change. And what you want to do is, is avoid two things. Number one is boiling the ocean, because then people go, this can't happen. You see, all of these things, it's all connected. It's all wrong. It's not going to work. So you, but this time, you don't back away. You say, could we absorb a little bit of pain? Could we make one inch of progress? And then what you do is you ally. Each of you works with your groups. And you say, hey, guys, aren't we really interested in good patient care? And what could we do to get it there? And everybody gives a little bit. Everybody takes a little heat from this consistency. So Patricia goes to the nurses, and she says, hey, this is 2010. We have to change. And Don says, you know, 
do you guys realize you're the first line, the front line of infection control? You know, that if we could actually clean our rooms faster and more efficiently, we could, we could actually give better care. And Hamilton says to his hospitalists, you know, we could do better, right? I mean, aren't we really in this in the, in, the, in, the, in the game for patient care? And then all of a sudden, Cindy has a resource that she can start using. And you set small goals. It may be that you're going to reduce wait times by 15 minutes, which isn't really a lot in a two-hour wait time, but it's going in the right direction. Performance improvement is incremental change that's almost unnoticeable. And it works by influence. What we just described right here was not the CMO coming in and saying, Cindy, you're going to do this. Hamilton, you're going to do this. Don, you're going to do this. What it is, <laughs> it is allegiances, alliances, influence. It's the ability to align people with what is right for best. And when people say, I can't do that, you have to really say, come on, let's try. This is for better patient care. This is for the patients. And that's often what actually makes a change. And, and when all of the performance improvement I got done when I was CMO was this incremental kind of stuff where you got people just to change their world one step at a time. Any thoughts on that? Any other, other observations of barriers? <coughs> This works well, what you've laid out with an intra-organizational structure, but I'm surprised that one of the things that didn't come up was discharge planning and getting patients to sniffs or rehab or having family members pick them up. So when you've got people outside the organization, what's the carrot that you have to draw them into this discussion? And now, now we get to healthcare reform because every system is designed to work the way it works. It, to get the result it gets. And our system, in fact, works exactly the way you said because it's motivated to work that way. So it's not going to be easy. In fact, what we have to do is in accountable care organizations, we have to have enough control over the whole environment internally and externally that we've actually worked out some of these relationships, that we have preferred nursing home pathways, that we have social workers whose jobs are, are greasing the wheels and the hospital values the discharge planning process by investing in it so that the intake part of the process and the imaging and lab part that are driving some of the cost effectiveness of the hospital are free to work more easily because the discharge process is better. This is going to be societal cultural change. No one hospital is going to be able to do this. In fact, one of the reasons accountable care organizations need to be as big as they are is that they have to have this mass effect that Don's talking about where you have to have the large scope to get the job done because you become a big player in the organization. We have time for one more question. Anybody else? <coughs> how do you cement the changes? And how do you, how, and the second part of it is how much of what you're doing is relationship so that when you go away, is it going to, is all the change going to go away when you leave because you're the glue that binds? Right. So the change has to be the organization's change not my change. So we could have a whole hour on change management. In fact, I teach a whole course on change management. So we can't, there's a real, real 30-hour answer to, to your question to you. That's how complicated <laughs> it is. Come take my course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, 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 stu we study this problem together. No, but Hugh is right. There is no way that you're going to be able to change things and make everything stick. But when change does last, what happens is the organization reaches a crisis. It has to unfreeze to be different. Leaders come in and realign things. They realign everybody's self-interest so that it aligns with what's best for the patient. And selfishness is removed. Your self-interest has to die. That's, that's going to be hard for many of our colleagues. And then in the end, the organization, by doing the right thing over and over, suddenly thinks the new thing is the way it's always been done. That's the most interesting thing, that when you have a change from A to B, no one wants to go to B because it's new. But when the organization finally gets to B, the same people who in A said, A is always the way we, we do it, we don't want to change, now they're doing B, and they will tell you, B is the way we've always done this. So p it's a natural kind of thing that people want to get to a stable point, and our job as leaders is actually to be disruptive. So and that's one of the powers of what we're doing. Okay, I think we need to stop, give Suzanne some time. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you again.
Thanks, Ed. And I can't think of a better start uh, to this program than having uh, Ed join us and share his insights here. Um, I'm going to have Lance go ahead and start changing. Uh, before I introduce the next speaker, I do want to mention a little bit more about uh, the Clinical Improvement Network uh, program and point out that uh, this actually is not only supported by the State Medical Association, and since you're here at this meeting, I assume most of you know a fair amount about the WSMA, but it's actually a joint project that has been uh, formulated by three groups. The first group is the Puget Sound Healthcare Alliance, which some of you may know is, I think, one of the premier groups working on uh, outcomes measures uh, and being able to share those measures back with the community and back with uh, our practices. And I, I think many of you may know that it was off to a, a roaring start about five years ago and was uh, releasing uh, primary care measures across a wide range of chronic disease and health maintenance uh, measures. And so having developed the measures, uh, the Alliance felt that supporting this organization and creating a, a forum to how to improve and address issues in the measures was a natural next step. The second partner, or the third partner in this uh, triumvirate, is the Washington Academy of Family Physicians. And they have actually been active in a wide range of quality improvement projects. Some of you may, uh, for example, have heard about the Washington uh, Medical Home Collaborative. Uh, the Family Practice Organization was one of the key supporters there. And so, again, this is a uh, joint project between the Alliance, the State Medical Association, and the Washington Academy of Family Physicians. I do want to also mention that this program is unique in that when it works on quality, it is actually focusing not on uh, the large institutions of medicine, and we have some great ones in the state, um, but primarily wants to focus on small to medium groups and how they, among their colleagues and their, their staff, can improve quality. And that actually is one of the uh, elements that led to our next speaker being chosen to speak. Uh, she is Dr. Suzanne Quistard, who is a family physician uh, practicing at the uh, Edmonds Family Medicine Clinic. She's got the usual interest in pediatrics and women's health care, among many, uh, and is a native of the Pacific Northwest and graduated from the Bowman Gray School of Medicine uh, and did a residency at Swedish, so is local and uh, one of us. Um, and one of her first activities was uh, being on point for working on smoking cessation, which is, I think, as many of you know, is one of our more thankless tasks. So that's an impressive start. Uh, and I think more recently has been involved in the installation and use of disease registries for tracking patients with chronic conditions. And that, I think, is one of the uh, things she's going to be discussing today. So I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Quistad. And again, thank you so much for sharing. See if I can figure this out. Can everyone hear me? Uh, good morning. I'm Suzanne Quiscard. Um, I'm originally from Port Angeles and now work up in uh, Edmonds at Edmonds Family Medicine. And uh, over the past year, I've had the uh, honor and challenge and excitement and stress of being involved in this uh, medical home collaborative and uh, trying to guide our clinic towards becoming a medical home. And that, ha and one of our many projects has been um, starting to use a registry system for our chronic disease patients. Uh, so that's what I'll be talking about today. So I think it's a nice uh, segue from our first talk, um, from talking about how important it is to have physicians in leadership to an example of uh, how you can lead your clinic uh, towards something like this. Now, I do not have any formal leadership training. Um, but I compensate by aligning myself with the right people. So all of our changes take place uh, within a team. So I have my CEO, I have my um, medical assistant uh, director, I have my own medical assistant, and I have uh, our IT specialist uh, on our team. So there's five of us. And we're the ones that we meet frequently, um, we make little goals for ourselves, and, uh, and we move forward. So um, as opposed to our first talk, this might be a little deaf by PowerPoint, but we'll go through it quickly. Um, these are our objectives today. Uh, first, I'll just describe what patient registries are and, and why they're important. I'm sure you all know that. We'll go through that quickly. Um, next, we'll go step by step how to create and use a patient registry. And then um, probably the most interesting uh, topic will be to share what we've done out at Edmonds Family Medicine. Yes, yes. 
this good? Okay. So patient registries, what are they? So a patient registry basically is a list of patients, uh, including relevant clinical information that alerts care providers when services are due. Uh, the registry can be used to track a chronic medical condition, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, CHF, fill in the blank, you name it. Uh, the patient registry can also be used to track preventive care services, uh, such as mammograms, colonoscopies, pap smear, and again, you name it. Information from patient registries is used during clinic visits to find patient information quickly and to plan care that follows clinical guidelines. Patient registry is used in between visits to identify patients who need follow-up. And the patient registry provides population reports to give care providers feedback about their performance. Registries give care providers the ability to manage chronic illness or preventive care in a proactive and organized manner. Uh, this leads to improved care, better patient outcomes, improved patient satisfaction, and I can vouch for this, improved physician satisfaction. Uh, contrast care without a registry. We sit, we wait for our patients to show up. Those patients who don't show up are neglected and fall through the cracks. So, how do you do this? So, I'm just curious, how many of you have electronic health records? Okay, so most. And of those who don't have electronic health records, how many have an office computer where you have basic word functions? Okay, anybody still just in the paper world? Okay, so we'll address that. You can do this no matter what you have. So, we'll, we'll go through it, go through everything here. So step one is, you know, depending on where your resources are, uh, make a plan um, as to how you're going to develop your registry system. Now if you have electronic medical records, you may have a registry system embedded into it, or you may need to purchase uh, one that uh, will work with your EMR. If you have an office computer, uh, you can actually use a spreadsheet program uh, such as Microsoft Excel uh, to track chronic disease. And there's a really nice example. I gave the uh, website here. If you go to the Family Practice Management Toolkit at aafp.org, um, there's a free downloadable sample of how to do this. Um, there is also uh, public domain software out there. Uh, this Chronic Disease Electronic Management System, or CDEMS, was actually developed by Washington State um, and is also available. Um, and if you go on that website, you can get more information. They have training sessions uh, as well. Um, and uh, that is what you can do with just an office computer. Now, if you only have paper, you can still do this. You can develop a system where you're using stickers to label charts uh, for whichever uh, registry you are developing, um, and then you can keep, keep track of your data in a logbook. So after you figure out you know, how you're gonna do this, the next step is to decide what patient population you want to focus on first. Um, so as we'll talk about later, um, in our clinic we decided to go with diabetes first, um, but you could pick whatever you'd like, pap smears, um, hypertension. Um, next after that is to figure out how you're going to get a list of patients in that chosen population. Uh, so you can go through billing records, diagnosis codes, uh, chart audits, um, and as your patients come in for their daily visits, you can get them into your registry. Uh, after you have your list, then you want to get your data that you've decided to collect. So if you have decided to do your cholesterol patients, you're going to want to get all those labs in there. Um, if you're doing diabetes, there's also physical exam findings you want to get in there, your eye exams, your foot exams. And also, you're going to need the information from your consultants. Uh, after you have all set up, then you can start using it. So now when your patients come in, you should be able to tell very quickly uh, what they're due for, are they in control, what do you need to do today. 
Um, in between visits, you can generate lists. You can recall patients who are due for services. Uh, now, in the you need the computer to do the population reports, but um, with the computer, you can also generate population reports. And what we do at our clinic is we actually give out a list. Has all this is not anonymous. It has all the physicians' names and it has all their numbers. And um, we find that to be a very useful tool um, to bring our outliers closer to the middle. And then you want to just keep it going. So you need a process for whenever those labs come in, they get put into the registry. Whenever the eye exam comes in from your consultant, that gets put into your diabetic registry. And yes, I've broken it down the steps, and I know I'm making it sound very easy, but it, it really does take quite a bit of time. Um, so my advice is to just take little steps. Um, it can be overwhelming to look at this big task, but once you get started, it's not so bad. And it's amazing when you look back, you know, six months to a year later, how much you can actually uh, accomplish. So, on to uh, what we've done here uh, or there out in Edmond. Um, so, as I said before, we're part of this Washington State Medical Home Collaborative. Um, there are 33 clinics in Washington uh, that are involved in this, uh, and we are all working on becoming a patient-centered medical home. Um, out at Edmond, our electronic medical record is GE Centricity. Does anybody have that? Oh, good. Okay. So um, there is an electronic health registry embedded into the system called Medical Quality Improvement Consortium, or MQIC, we, we call it for short. Um, we had a chance to get another system um, that has a few more bells and whistles, so we decided not to use this one. What we went with is one um, that's called Care Manager. And I have some nice slides coming up where I'll show you how that works. It's very user friendly. Um, so we actually were able to get a grant from our local hospital, Stevens, which is now Swedish Edmund, uh, to help us purchase this. And uh, we, have a we have definitely worked on developing a good relationship with our hospital, kind of you rub our back, we'll rub yours. Um, and we are very pleased that they decided to help us out with this. So originally this product was developed for Providence uh, in Portland. It has the ability to track chronic diseases, and I've listed all the capabilities there, diabetes, uh, I think that should be CHF, I'm not sure what CHR is asthma, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, hyperlipidemia, atrial fib, Coumadin, and they're coming out with a COPD module. Uh, also has the ability to track preventive care, pap smears, DEXAs, um, and soon we'll be able to track mammograms and colonoscopies as well. So, uh, so after we decided to use Care Manager, uh, we sat down and decided which um, uh, population we wanted to improve. And we had already done some work in improving our diabetes uh, care, and everybody was kind of already on board with that, so we decided to really focus on our diabetes first. The other nice thing about this is I think that diabetes care is one of the most complicated ones to master. Um, so I think once we get this, I think it won't be as hard uh, to get our other modules going. So we decided to track diabetes, um, and then we sat down and decided which parameters uh, we wanted to monitor. So uh, we came up with the A1C, the LDL, blood pressure, urine microalbumin, the flu and pneumovac shots, foot exam, and eye exam. Um, Care Manager also has the ability to track tobacco use, aspirin, statins, and, and BMI, um, but our main core is, uh, is that first, um, first group. Uh, once we had gotten this far, um, we uh, developed our patient list for each physician. Now, for our clinic, we also staff an emergency clinic, a walk-in clinic that's open evenings and weekends. So we actually have quite a few patients in our system that aren't really our patients. Um, 
so what we did to kind of sort that out is we basically just handed a list to all the doctors and the medical assistants and had them go through the list, which was certainly a little tedious, but, um, but go through and, and figure out, is this really your patient? Is this not a clinic patient? Um, and is it a clinic patient, but you're not the regular doctor? So we got all the lists sorted out. Um, we also identified patients that were ours, but followed by consultants. Um, once we were that far, um, then we started a concerted effort to get our information from our consultants, the recent labs, uh, eye exams, um, et cetera. Uh, the nice thing about having the care manager work with our EMR is that uh, the labs and immunizations that we put into our system get sucked out by the care manager, so we don't have to do any updating there. Now, on this step, we came to our first major snafu, and that was that the care manager program wasn't recognizing our data. So, yeah, <laughs> it looked great uh, when it was viewed at Providence Portland, but not so great with us. And it all came down to we had a new version of Centricity. Uh, and, you know, I'm not an IT person, but whatever data you need to, whatever imprint you need to recognize the data just wasn't working. So um, this, um, this was a major setback, but slowly and surely, um, I do think that Care Manager now recognizes all of our major data fields. Um, the last ones for it to recognize were flu and pneumovax, but we could still do a lot of good care without it recognizing the flu and pneumovax. So, so once you know, it, could have, it could recognize the major stuff, we, we carried on. Um, and we had our uh, medical assistants call or send letters to our patients that were overdue for follow-up. Um, and then we passed out the baseline population reports so the physicians all had an idea of, of how they were doing. Um, so this actually, I think you can read pretty clearly. Um, this is how the care manager screen um, shows up. So it's very nice. Um, you know, you'll have the patient name over, oops, I'm attached. You have the patient name here uh, on the left, um, and then it has those parameters that we decided to follow, and then it gives you a color. So you can very easily look at this and see if your patient's up to date or not. So red is bad, green is good. Um, there's also a yellow color, and yellow means that it's coming up to be due soon. Um, so it was really easy for the medical assistants to just kind of look through this, see what people were overdue for, you can also look at this and see if they have an appointment scheduled. So if they have an appointment scheduled, then, you know, we're all set. Um, now, the only problem we got into this, well, I'll back up. Um, this was a really good practice for us. You know, I had these diabetic patients come in and see me that I felt like I hadn't seen in years. And they were so happy to come in, too. You know, you, you kind of feel like, well, you're bugging them. They're not coming in for some reason. Um, but they came in. They were so happy we contacted them. We were feeling so good about this. And then, um, you know, I come to work one day, and my partner says, oh, I saw one of your patients yesterday, and she's just really not in good control. Her blood sugar was 450, and she hadn't been in in almost a year. And I thought, well, how could that happen? We sent letters to everyone. Well, it turns out that it only recalls the A1C once a year. So she'd been in maybe 11 months ago. She was all green on everything else, but her A1C was like 10. Um, so what we figured out is you really have to toggle between this other screenshot, which is treatment review. Um, and if you look on the treatment review, then your A1C will show up there. It's kind of right there in the middle here. So it shows up and actually with the number two. So if you toggle between the two screens, it's, it's a good system, but you just have to remember that if your A1C looks green, it doesn't necessarily mean that all is good. So, um, and this is what the population uh, feedback tab looks like. So uh, I can go on my computer at work and I can pull this up for all my patients and see how I'm doing. Now, the, the purple line at the top is the top 10% of physicians. Um, I think 
it, ours is based against the Providence Group, since that's who this was originally developed for. And then your um, or my um, numbers will show up in green. So I can see how I'm doing um, as compared to the top 10% uh, performance. The other great thing about this system is we can communicate with our patients through it. So we can um, generate letters um, that are very user friendly, also um, use this color system. So I can send a letter to all my patients that are due. It'll have all the parameters that we track and it'll have a color and it'll explain the color to the patient and let them know how they're doing on their diabetes care and what they're due for or overdue for. Uh, the other nice thing is I can also, you know, if I have some information about a diabetes class that I wanted to send to my patients, I could select all my diabetic patients, maybe with an A1C above seven, click those boxes, and I can send them all a general letter, hey, there's a diabetes class, you might be interested. Um, so there's some really nice capabilities with this that we haven't quite tapped into yet, but will be. So here's another setback. Remember how we're talking about you should use this registry at every patient visit. You pull it up, you see how your patient's doing. Well, if you open up Care Manager while you're in a chart note, the whole system just goes haywire. So, so that, yeah, that's not good either. But I am told that this is going to be repaired very shortly. <laughs> so what we have developed as a compensation is we have this we have this thing we call quick text and I don't know if all electronic health records do this but if I just put in it's a dot and I put in diabetes our system can actually suck out the last you know a1c cholesterol you know kind of all those things we're monitoring anyway even though I don't get the nice colors but I get a list of numbers so it works so that's kind of how we've compensated until we can't open our care manager and then lastly, um, you know, we have to maintain the data collection. So what we've set up is we have one medical assistant who kind of mans this desktop, we call it, um, with outside data. So whenever any of our doctors see a note from an endocrinologist with labs, foot exam, or do you see the eye exam come through, you sign off of it and you just route it to this desktop and they'll pop it into the system. Um, now anything that's done through our clinic, like I said before, the, the care manager automatically keeps track of it. So it's just the outside stuff that we have to input. So, um, so that's where we are now. Um, you know, in the future, we hope to expand and improve. We hope to uh, get a health coach uh, available for our patients who we just can't get under control. Um, we hope to do more in terms of planned visits having patients come in with labs already done, um, eye exam already done, so you, we can just sit down and talk to patients about their results uh, instead of this, you know, come in, get the labs, and then try to get them back to talk about, okay, this is abnormal, we need to start you on a statin or whatever that might be. Um, we also have a neat um, uh, interactive diabetes class that we'll be starting here in the fall called Journey for Control. Um, and it's really, it's just this big game uh, that the diabetic patients play. And they go around the game board and every, um, you know, every place they stop, it's very interactive with questions, discussions, um, and those kinds of things. Um, we'd like to expand to track more chronic diseases. We'd also like to start uh, getting our preventative care services uh, in there. So, so this is a year about that we've been doing this. Although I would say, you know, when we started that care manager and it didn't recognize our data, we probably took a good, I don't know, four to five months off before we got on track again. But you can see just with this imperfect uh, first year that we've made quite a dent in improving our numbers. So um, the percent of patients with an LDL under 100 has increased by 14.7%. Uh, decreasing the blood pressure to less than 130 over 80 has increased by 10%. Getting our A1C under 7 has increased by 13.89%. Uh, microalbumin 
uh, testing has increased by 20 percent, uh, foot exams increased by 21 percent, and retinal exams have also increased by 21 percent. So, um, so we're quite proud of the numbers, and like I said, I think, you know, this is not, you know, we don't have it down perfectly yet, um, but we're getting there. And that's, that's our presentation.